This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Darrell Rasnick and I'm pleased to serve as one of the pastors at Church Street. At this time, I invite you to listen as our organist E.D. Johnson plays Allegro from Concerto in A Minor. This morning I invite you to take your Bible and follow along as we read from two places, first from Isaiah chapter 5, and then we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 21. So we'll start with Isaiah. Hear these words now from Isaiah 5. 
Let me sing for my beloved my love, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done for it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make a waste of it and it shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting he expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. And now from Matthew chapter 21, Jesus is speaking as he says these words. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone this is what the Lord is doing. It is amazing in our eyes. May God bless the reading and our hearing of the word. Let us pray. Gracious God, now may our words and the thoughts that we share be acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, sometimes that Jesus' parables are ways to make truth more accessible taking complicated theological ideas and putting them in terms that anyone can understand. But you will remember that Jesus said that he told parables for the opposite reason, so that the crowds might not understand. It's a very puzzling statement to be sure, but it's a statement that fits the reality of how puzzling the parables can be when we enter fully into them as stories. Sometimes I think most of, I spend most of my time misreading the Bible and therefore misunderstanding what God is telling me. For example, I read a story or a parable and I'm convinced it's not about me or us, it must be about them. I play a, a game of gladiator or matador with the scriptures. I have the God's word charging at me only to jump aside at the last minute. At times, though, I'm convinced of my own righteousness. And every star, stone I turn over in scriptures is just one more truth about how good I really am and perhaps how much God is really out to get me. I fail to see the goodness in others because I'm certain of their own failings, the splinter in their eye that the sawmill in my own eye keeps me from seeing. In our politically charged and divided world, pastors are advised just to stay away from those issues. But isn't that the real problem? that we are content with the divided nature of our society, the lines and boundaries that we draw, that we aren't willing to engage in meaningful dialogue with each other. When confronted, we are sometimes tempted to resolve our ambiguities by ignoring them. And when reading the stories of the Bible, we immediately interpret them as being about someone else. In today's parable, we are immediately jumping into an allegorical reading and we start with our own expectations, with what we think we know is true. 
Then we look at parts of the story, the characters, the objects, the actions. We decide which character or object in the parable is God, which one is Jesus, what the other things in the parable represent. And we work toward a truth that is in harmony with our own expectations. But that's not what parables are for. Jesus' parables aren't there to make complicated truths simple, but to complicate what may seem simply true, to help us see the gray in our simplistic black and white, our us versus them world. The parable in today's gospel is an excellent case in point. If we jump immediately and not carefully to allegory, it's a simple story. The landowner is God. God sends messengers to the people, particularly to Israel and therefore all Jewish people. The people reject the messengers. God sends his son. The people kill the son. So God is going to reject Israel and choose another people. But how well does that really fit? How well does that interpretation fit the weight of the canon regarding the role of Israel and even our own part in that? In Isaiah 5, God sings of God's love for us. As excellent as any air supply song from the 80s, God is truly infatuated with his people. Let me sing a song of my beloved, he says. Isaiah sings of how God, his beloved, did everything possible to set up a healthy, thriving vineyard. The soil was fertile, cultivated, the stones were removed, only the finest quality vines are planted, a watchtower in the middle, a wine vat was built in preparation for the harvesting and processing of grapes. So far, so good. The love song is the most pleasant thing to our ears, and we as listeners are touched by the, the nurturing care of God. What a wonderful love song the prophet Isaiah is serenading us with. But, but wait a minute. Before we fall asleep with the tender words, listen to what follows. Surprise, surprise, Isaiah's love song is transformed into a song of hard-hitting judgment and lament. Maybe we can gain the sense of such an unpleasant surprise by thinking of the love song as a gentle bedtime lull lullaby, which is suddenly transformed into this condemning, deafening, heavy metal rock and roll song. In any case, the irony of the song comes to the forefront when Isaiah, speaking of God, asks the people of Jerusalem and Judah to judge between me, God, and my vineyard, the people. God tells his people there's nothing more that he could do to succeed. He had done everything. Implied here in the song is that human freedom that God gives us. In that song that God the beloved expects the best from us. He expected grapes, but all he got was the wild. So the consequence of freedom being misused or abused is that the well cared for vineyard becomes neglected and turns into a wasteland of briars and thorns. The concluding verse of the song makes it clear the vineyard represents God's chosen people, those people. God expected and hoped that his people would ensure that there was justice for everyone in the nation. Instead of justice, the wealthy politicians and business people were killing society's weakest and most vulnerable. Blood was on the hands of the rich and powerful since their wealth was gained by cheating and robbing the poorest. God expected and hoped for righteousness in his people and instead he hears a cry of oppressed and the poor. God expected his people would look after the poor. After all, those who were now blessed with wealth have a good life. They, had ancestors, they and their ancestors had cried out as slaves, and God had heard that. And hearing those cries had delivered them from their slavery. Why now did they abuse their freedom and become selfish and greedy? Love seems to go all wrong in this song. What happens? Does the flame die? Perhaps God is the one whose love just runs out, or maybe it's the inhabitants of the vineyard who turn away. Is the landowner in the parable really like God of Israel, revealed in Scripture and proclaimed by Jesus? Let's start then with the literal details of Matthew's parable and examine them in the light and what we know about the culture that gave us the story. The setting of the parable is that there was a very wealthy landowner. The landowner doesn't live on the land, doesn't do the work of planting and harvesting. He hires people to do that. They have turned over most of what they do 
to the landowner. The landowner who is similar in a similar parable, it, we learn about landowners who are hard men who expect a lot. The absentee landowner doesn't send messengers out of any great love for the people, but to get what's coming to him, the goods that sustain his life of ease in the city. Finally, the farmers have had enough, but why? The next time the landowner sends his lackeys to collect the rent, the farmers send them packing. I can almost hear the cheer that erupted from the audience as Jesus told this parable. Then the landowner sends another henchman to collect rent, and the farmers again work together to send him away empty-handed. Again, the cheer of the crowd. Then one more person comes riding into the dusty city, the sun. The anticipating crowd listens. Why would the son, the beloved, probably the only child come instead of a messenger? Such thing might indicate the landowner had died and his son was coming to survey what he had inherited. And here comes an opportunity for the farmers. If the son dies, he does not have an heir. The land goes with those who live on it. The farmers will be free. The farmers do what real men would have expected to do. After years of exploitation, they rise up and they kill the son. And then comes the twist. The landowner is not dead. He does precisely what he would be expected to do under such circumstances. He wreaks terrible revenge, slaughtering the farmers and replacing them with others so he can return once more to the ease of the city while others make his keep. I think it's safe that no cheers erupted from the parable hearers at that point. The chief priests and scribes in the audience who came from that rich class weren't cheering. Jesus had issued a scathing critique of their dealing with their fellow Israelites and the peasant farmers in the audience weren't cheering either. They have just heard a graphic reminder of how the spiral of violence will resort in more violence, violence they can't sustain. The landowner's family and the peasants alike are standing up for themselves as they, their culture expects honorable families to do, brought everyone down in these moments. But wait a minute. That's what we thought this story would say. Like those who heard this story, that's the way we would have ended it. But notice, if you will, that Jesus asks the question, what will the landowner do? The people, us, scream for justice. No mercy here, only getting even. Getting even? Those sorry tenants. We'll show them who's the boss. Like the Pharisees that heard the parable so long ago, we are convinced that those people are, result, are responsible for the acts of violence against the landowner, and they should be punished. In what ways are we living into the parable of Jesus' life, the model Jesus shows us of care for those the world disregards and disregards the world's standards of strength and honor? You see, Jesus challenges them and us to do the unthinkable, to turn the other cheek, to let others think us weak because we are them and they are us. Jesus challenges us to bless and honor peacemakers rather than the mighty, to strive for justice and peace and the dignity of every human being above our own comfort, to not return an act of violence with another act of violence. It seems to me we vow to do that in our own baptismal comfort covenant, and that's the way God's people are. When we say to someone who is baptized, you are sealed and marked as Christ's own forever, that's a way in which we are committing the baptized and, and we commit ourselves to be made anew. It's a way of seeing truth and life differently. It's a way of abundant life that God offers. For while we exercised our might, it's a promise that absolute and faithful and loving God can raise us up. The stone that was deemed useless and unnecessary has become the keystone of what God is building. It's the paradox of the story. In our day and age, has anything really changed? We hear stories of injustice and ill-gotten gain today and we want to respond. Our, our planet is moaning and groaning doing self, due to selfishness and greed of the minority of the world's population. We, the us in every story, are certain 
that we are not like them. Just listen to every story on the nightly news. Violence against one another in Egypt and Syria and our own cities. Immigration, health care, marriage, politics. We are truly divided because we choose to be so. If we take Scripture seriously and believe the stories of Jesus are really about us, there's a pressing question facing us today. Are we really a caring society? How should we respond to the violence and brokenness of the world? Are we ready to not make this about us versus them in the economy of scarcity? Answering the question, I don't think it's helpful to employ labels, us and them, and Republican and Democrat, and liberal and conservative. In a caring society, it is God's contract that guarantees the right to adequate food, shelter, clothing, education, health care, a system that provides equal services to all without any feeling of guilt on the part of the recipients. And to quote a contemporary Isaiah, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Ellie Wiesel, we must not, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Human rights are being violated on every continent. More people are oppressed than free. How can we not be sensitive to their plight? You see, human suffering anywhere concerns us, everywhere. There's so much to be done. There's so much that can be done. One person, a Mother Teresa, an Albert Schweitzer, a Martin Luther King Jr., one person of integrity can make a difference. A difference in the story of life and death, of us versus them. As long as one dissident is in prison, our freedom will not be true. As long as one child is hungry, our lives will be filled with shame. As long as someone dies alone and unloved, we cannot live. What all these victims need above all is to know that they are not alone, that we are not forgetting them, that when their voices are stifled, we shall lend them ours, that their freedom depends on ours. The quality of our freedom depends on theirs. And in a world of scarcity where I must get mine so you can't get yours, there is no us, and we are them. No one knows heartbreak like God. God poured out heart and soul into a people who were to bring freedom and justice and goodness to a broken world. And instead, they subjected their own brothers and sisters to oppression and turned their backs on what would bring hope and life to the world. We, we did that. God's case is against us, not them. This parable is, is kind of crazy when you think about it. Why on earth do these guys think they're going to inherit the vineyard? Oh, I know it's a possibility, but the landlord is not likely to disappear. He sent his servants and more servants and then a son. Who can say that he doesn't have more sons and more servants and an army or at least a gang of thugs to take care of his will? They're crazy to think that they can't get this. They're crazy, but they're not half as crazy as God. Thinking about all the things that have happened, he continues to send more, not the police, mind you, but those who would express his love and care for those around him. That's God's case against us, that we would receive the love not directed at them, but directed at us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now I invite you to listen as we share together from the parish handbell choir as they play Be Thou My Vision.
In the end, this parable of the vineyard is not about God's case against us, but about God's love for us that comes over and over and over again, telling us how much God would love us if only we would respond. And so now I invite you, if you would like to come to worship at Church Street, to join us on Sunday mornings, 8.30 or 11 o'clock, Sunday school at 9.40 in between those services. I am Daryl Raznick, a pastor at Church Street. Thank you for letting us share these moments together today. God bless you. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice.